All right, good to have you all here. How you doing today? Doing good? Awesome, good, good, good. Across all of our sites online, welcome to Village Church. So glad you're part of this thing. Uh, we are done the uh, nine keys to happiness. And so today we're jumping back into the Gospel of John that we started a little bit ago. Uh, really what we do here, if you're new, is we go through biblical books and then we take that biblical teaching, we apply it to our lives, talk about modern life and how it connects to the Gospel of Jesus and the biblical story. And uh, we're going through the Gospel of John, one of the great books uh, of the Bible. And, uh, and we got through seven chapters in the last little bit. I don't know how long it's been, maybe nine months or so. Uh, and so we kind of ripped through these things really quick. But um, we're in chapter seven today. So if you got a Bible, go there. And I'm really going to hone in. I don't know my TV with me today. Uh, it's coming back next week. It was locked in a cabinet somewhere. Uh, but when we get it back, we're going to go through that verse by verse. Because I don't like to just show you conclusions. I don't want to just tell you what to think. I want to show you how to think. And that's part of the Christian life is how we come to conclusions by taking the Bible, which has an authority over our lives and saying, okay, what does it actually teach us about God, about life, about salvation? And today I'm just going to hone in pretty simple uh, on a couple of verses. So if you've got a Bible, John chapter 7 is where we're going to be. And I'm really going to probably get to only uh, one or two verses today. Um, here's the thing. A few years ago, uh, I went to India. And uh, when I was uh, privileged enough to go on a mission trip to India and just love and serve those people, walk around for like a couple weeks through the villages of India, just watch the missionaries there, tell people about Jesus, love and serve them, do some dentistry stuff there, they, them doing it, not me. Um, and then... <laughs> Because that would have gone really bad really quick. Uh, but they were like helping people, pulling tea, all these beautiful things. And I remember the, the, the thing that like more than anything else, what you realize when you go to those places, right? The, the hot places, the dusty places, places where you just have barren land. Uh, you realize how important water is. And I remember I, I would hike and I had this like 60 pound pack on and uh, I had never really been hiking before. And they said, hey, we're gonna go to India. We're gonna, I'm like, oh great. So I put this 60 pound pack and by day one, I'm like taking it off and my Sherpa, just did the, the guy, one of the guys traveling, just took half my stuff. And he said, it's okay, it's okay, I got it. I'm like, okay, you're good. So I was left with like, you know, 10 pounds uh, for the rest of the trip. And I realized as I hiked, uh, I would just run out of energy and I'd just be done. It was super hot, it was dusty. And this is what you begin to realize when you're anywhere in the Middle East or whatever. It's like, uh, Jesus wasn't a 21st century Canadian. Um, he was a first century Jew living in the Middle East and the imagery that he gives, the symbolism, the stories, the things that he teaches draw from that world more than they draw from ours. And sometimes we have trouble injecting ourselves into that story. But we're going to realize that today Jesus draws on this deep desire, this deep understanding that water is in fact life. And I remember climbing up that thing and I never realized it before, but I would climb and climb and climb and then I'd hit this particular point and I'd be done, like done, done, done. Like, have you felt like that kind of exhaustion where you can't take another step, you're completely done, you can't go anywhere? And I was like, and I would just lay down and I remember I would crack the bottle of water and I would drink it and I would literally feel sustenance come back to my body and allow me to get back up and go for another two hours. That was the craziest experience because living in a culture like ours, we don't tend to get to the utter end of exhaustion and need water. But when it happens, you realize so much of the biblical story revolves around this great moment, which we're going to see um, if, we, uh, if we ever get to it. So here we go. John chapter 7, verse 37 says this. On the last day of the feast. So the feast that he's talking about from before the, the, the Nine Keys to Happiness series is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was this idea, there was about three times in the New Testament times where if you were a guy and you lived about 15 miles from Jerusalem, you would have to do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem about three times a year. All right, you would go uh, during Passover, you would go during Pentecost, and then you would go during the Feast of Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. And it was about, uh, it happened about October 15th. So about this time of year, every year in Jerusalem, they would go and they would pilgrimage. And Jerusalem would be ran with like all these hundreds of thousands of people that don't, no, weren't normally there. And they would set up all these little tents and booths and things that they would actually live in. So it was interesting because the whole city became this kind of city of, of all these booths, all these little tents. So picture like going to like, 
Vegas. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But you go to a conference and everyone has their booths set up to try to sell you your stuff. It's like people are living in these things for a little bit when they're on their pilgrimage. And what, that, well, what it was, the great feast was, um, it was, it was in celebration, this is very important, for God having delivered Israel in Egypt, of course, that was like the central story to a first century Jew, was the time that God had delivered them from, from the slavery of Egypt, brought them to the Red Sea. They go out to the wilderness for 40 years, and, and they're tabernacling around. God is in a tabernacle, which is like this tent that can be moved, but then they're living in these little tabernacles and these little booths out in the wilderness for 40 years. And this feast, one of the three pilgrimages every year, was this moment to commemorate that. And so one Old Testament text um, actually talks about this idea. It says, its purpose, uh, this festival, is that your generation may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. That your generation, the generation under you, will know something that happened in the past that they're never going to appreciate unless you have this kind of rite of passage. And I do this with my kids all the time, right? I grew up in the 80s, and I tried to tell my kids what life was like. This, this week, uh, I introduced my oldest to the show Lost. I don't know if you guys, you know, watch Lost, came out in two. So I, she's like, well, what's Lost about, Dad? I'm like, well, honey, your mother and I, <laughs> when we met many years ago, we got married and we drove across the country to Vancouver and we knew nobody. Nobody's friend. We didn't have any friends. We didn't know anybody's anybody, anybody, nobody. We grow, put all our stuff in a car, drove four days so I could go to school. We knew no, nobody's uncles, friends, brothers, no connections. And the show came out that year. It was, it was summer 2004. It came into the fall and the show came out called Lost. We never see him, and every Tuesday or Wednesday night, we'd get together and with, and with people that we'd meet, we'd watch Lost, and then it would always end in this cliffhanger, and you never knew what was going to happen. It started with them on an island, and then these polar bears came out, and then you never, and it was going, and then the episode would end. And so I started watching it with her this week, and we watched episode one. She's like, what's happening? This is the greatest thing ever. Let's go number two. And of course, it just goes, and then boom, 30 seconds later, we're watching another episode. And then, so it was one o'clock in the morning at this point. Right? We've watched six episodes of Lost, and I'm like done because I'm an old man. And she's like, let's run another one. And I'm like, honey, you got to understand what it was like when I was watching this show. You'd have to wait a whole week. So I'm going to make you wait a week. All right? And then when May comes, I'm going to stop it on the season finale. And you're going to have to sit around all summer and wonder what happened to these people on the island. You see, I, and she just looked at me. She said, Dad, stop making me and my generation tried to live like you did. <laughs> Don't project your awfulness and your reality on me because I can just watch all this as much as I want. And I do this all the time is I try to make them understand what life was like for me as a rite of passage. And I try to make them live like an 80s kid and they just kick against it all the time because I turned out good. So I want them to turn out good. I, want them, I don't want to turn, turn, turn out like a psychopath scrolling Instagram all day, thinking that's reality. you got to grow up like an 80s kid. So this is rites of passage that we do with our kids. So that they'll appreciate how we grew up so that they'll understand. That's what God is doing with all these booths and all these symbolic traditions that we in the modern world don't tend to do. My wife does this very well with our uh, girls. She, uh, when they turn 13, they all get a trip that's very oriented to their passion. They go away for three days with Aaron. They talk about womanhood. They talk about social media. They go and do something somewhere that really kind of plays into their passions in life. We don't do this enough as a culture, these symbolic moments that force you to look back at something and understand something. Israel was full of it at this time, full of these moments of tradition and symbolism. And so that's what this grace feast is about. And then it says this, on that last day of the feast, verse 37 we are in John chapter 7, the great day, which was the, the final, the last day of it, Jesus stood up and cried out. Now, uh, if you got a, if you got a, 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 a pen or something, pencil, or you got up on your phone, just double click cried out. Because I love this. <laughs> Guys, just think about that. For, he, we tend to think of Jesus as Mr. Monotone. Like when we watch the movies, he's just like this white, you know, Norwegian guy with you know, hair and blue eyes. So he stands out. 
and he walks around monotone and he kind of, and he, either you love your enemy, pray for those. And it's like dead. Jesus Christ cried out. He yelled. Some of you, I know, you're, you wonder to yourself, I see your comments online. You're like, why does this guy yell so much? Because I want to be like Jesus, y'all. Right? It's like, why is this guy? Because it's just like, like, he cried. Guys, some of you are asleep at the wheel and your life is so mundane and boring, you never cry out. We need you to cry out sometimes. When Jesus is preaching here, he's not just monotoning his way through life going, hey everybody, glad you're here. You have ideas, I have ideas, all the ideas are equal. Right, that's Canadian. I'm sorry, that's not, that's not what, he's crying out. He's like desperate in this moment to get people's attention. Why, why? And this just welled up in me as I read this. Why are we so chill? Right, yeah, why? (laughs) Why are we so chill, man? Why don't we cry out more? Because you know, when we started our church, um, there's 50 people in this elementary school gym and started telling people about Jesus and people started to get saved and, and people started to show up. And we had, we had this moment, there's 300 people in this gym and we pushed the curtains back and people sitting outside and it was like, okay, it's time to do the dreaded, you know, two services, go to two services. And I was like, wow, two services, oh no. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna kill the church. We're gonna go to two services. I'm not gonna be able to see Joanne anymore and have her over for lunch and gonna be the nail in our coffin. And I was like, my gosh, I remember a woman said that. And I'm like, what? So the next week I got up and preached a sermon. I said, we're going to two services. If you don't like it, go to any other churches in in the neighborhood. I didn't start a church so that you could get more friends. I started a church because every day people like my father die and go to hell. That's why we did this. It's not so you can have another cozy place to come to and you can get more buddies to bring over for lunch. Every day, people like my father, and so we we went to two services and grew by 50 people. Well, 49 people, she left. 49 people in a week. But here's the thing that struck me about that, is sometimes, you know, I wanna show you a picture of my father. I'll put it up on the on the screens, uh, you won't be able to see it really well because I'm a little kid in it. So my, you can see in this picture, uh, my brother is older, I'm young, blonde kid. My brother and I couldn't look or be more different as people. If you ever met him, you would never, you would never know it was, he was connected to me. It's just like we're too. Uh, but my dad, that's my dad. Um, so my, my parents divorced when I was nine. Uh, he died when I was 15 of lung cancer, and. Here's what hit me last night, to be honest with you, as I was thinking about this, and I started thinking about um, him not coming to know Jesus that I know of and, and dying. And um, Man, he's more than a sermon illustration. To, to, over time, he, even in my mind, he, he grows into this mythology of a sermon illustration of someone who wasn't biblical and didn't want us to go to church and didn't like Christianity, but... I was like, it was funny, I was listening, when I write sermons, I listen to, uh, like, music, like, like movie soundtracks. And, and, of course, the sermons are almost, always more epic, <laughs> because I'm like, so every time I'm writing, I'm like, gladiators playing, I'm like, oh, man, I'm taking over the world right now, I'm, writing, I'm killing the emperor, and then I get here, and I'm like, Nyeh. anyway, so, uh, but, you know, I'm listening to Field of Dreams soundtrack. Have you ever seen that movie? And, of course, the climax of that movie is a guy who's lost his father too early and they play catch at the end because his dad uh, is the one. You know, he's the one. If you build it, he will come. It was not actually Shula Stroh Jackson. It was about his dad. And he takes his thing off at the end and they play catch. And, and every man, there's two kinds of men in the world. There's men who cry at the end of Field of Dreams and men who lie about it and say they didn't. Um, but I'm, I, last night, to be honest, I'm just, I was sobbing at my, my little office desk. I was sobbing thinking about my dad. And that's why I wanted to show you, like, to humanize the fact that if he didn't come to know Jesus, like, this is the reason we need to cry out. 
These are real people. Real souls. That, that end the, that, and, and some of you, you have people in your life and you're just, you're not crying out. You're not doing anything. You're just going to coast through life and talk about getting a new car and redo the kitchen and should I invest in real estate and mundane stuff that doesn't have any eternal bearing and you're just clicking through days, wasting them when these people are alive and well right now and need you to flag them down and cry out and get their attention. That's what Jesus is doing. He's getting the attention of the world that doesn't care. And sometimes we just don't get the fact that people, listen, um, you know what Satan wants from us? He doesn't need you to go to the satanic church down the street and like, like dress up in horns and black gowns and like be a Satanist. That's not what he needs. He just needs you to be distracted and never come to treasure Jesus Christ as your ultimate treasure. That's it. That's his only game. He doesn't need you to even join some false religion, nothing. He just needs to distract you long enough that you never cry out. Because nobody, like here's the thing, if you hang out with Christians long enough, you begin to believe that people know about Christianity just by default. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. You know, it's like that line of Gandalf says the Hobbit's like the Middle Earth is all warring and fighting and Gandalf's like, buddy, nobody knows the, about the Shire. And I'm glad they don't. Nobody knows about the existence of hobbits, he says. Guys, nobody knows about Christian, like nobody cares. I was just at a, uh, so I was in San Diego last week. So they got me to fly down and they said, hey, we want you to preach this leadership conference. So I preached the leadership conference. Then they're like, hey, you're down here anyway. Why don't you just preach at this men's conference too? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then they're like, you know what? You're already down here. Why don't you preach for our weekend? So I preach eight times at this church in San Diego. And, uh, and so my flight, I was supposed to fly back on the Monday, and the, there was weather stuff in Vancouver, and they were like, I don't know. So we delayed the flight a day. So I had this extra day. So I'm like, what do I do? I'm in San Diego, and I'm staying at this hotel. And uh, this guy that I'd met, one of the elders of the church I was preaching, he's like, you know, I'm in this golf tournament that's at the hotel you're staying at. Why don't you just come play the golf tournament? And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm like looking out my window. I see all these golfers come. I go, sure. So I go down, I pay my registration fee. I'm like, I'm going to be on your team. He's, when I get there, he's like, no, no, no. I already have a team. I don't know who you're going to be with. <laughs> okay. So I just walk up with my golf clubs and put it in this golf cart and walk over here and get my little lunch thing. And I turn around and there's this woman in my golf cart. She's like, hey, what's going on? Who are you? I'm like, I'm Mark. Who? And she's like, why are you here? I'm like, I'm, I'm your fourth. And she's like, oh, we didn't want necessarily a fourth. And I'm like, great. It's very inviting, by the way. Uh, and she's like, yeah. I said, well, what do you do? She's like, well, I run a private jet company. I'm like, of course you do. And she's like, and that's the CEO of the company, and that's the COO, and I'm the head of marketing, and this is the team you've joined. So I walk, I, I'm like, a private jet company? Are you serious? I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to make some connections today. All right, so, so I walk. Up to my buddy, I'm like, come here, come here. I'm like, the team I'm on is a private jet company. And he's like, yeah, I know, because every team in this tournament's a private jet company. And I'm like, oh, yes, all right, I've hit the jackpot. So I get in, we go to the first hole, and they all sucked. They were terrible. So they're whacking the ball all over the place, and I just, boom, drill one right down the middle, 280 yards, and they're like, what's happening? You're good at golf? I'm like, what's up? And for the rest of the day, I was Tiger Woods to these people, all right? I was, I was, I mean, they're, by the, they were terrible. I'm draining pots, I'm putting, they're like, we are flying you down here next year to play this golf tournament. I'm like, what's up? All right, so. But as we're going around, you know, I'm talking to them about what they do for a living. And, and at one point, the, the, one of the uh, people on the course was selling some stuff and, and we walked up and she's like, hey, would you like to, you know, buy a thing? And I, and I looked at her, and I could just see in her eyes something was wrong with her. And I said, what's wrong? And she's like, nothing, nothing. Would you like to buy some things? I'm like, well, I did, would, but what's wrong? And she just goes, ah. <laughs> and she starts to cry. And I'm like, come on, what's going on? I said, 
I'm a pastor, you know, what's, I can tell something's up. And, she, and then it was just, oh, it was just like spill time. It was like, well, my girlfriend, my slept with my dad, and I can't believe it. And she just leans into me and I hug her and she's bawling. And I just said, listen, I'm going to be praying for you today. She's like, what do you mean? I'm, I said, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to pray for you that your heart is able. And so a couple of holes later, the CEO walks up to me. Multi, hundreds of millions of dollars, private company. He walks up, he's like, what was that? I'm like, what? He's like, I've never seen someone hug a random girl on a golf course and pray for her in the midst of her pain. I don't understand what it is you do. And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He's like, I've never met a pastor in my life. What? I've never met a pastor. What do you mean? He's like, I, I don't hang, I don't even, like Christianity, that's still a thing? And then they start getting pictures with me and they're like sending it to their friends and like, this is so weird, this pastor, Tiger Woods or whatever his name is. And <laughs> like guys, we, in those moments, those actions cry out to people. They get people's attention that we actually function different than the world functions. We're actually very counter, we're very weird people that get the attention of people who are just going through life and they're not intending on sitting asking the massive existential questions that you and I sit in every day. They're just going on with life. I have neighbors, they, they found out I was a Christian. They bought, they said, we're gonna, they brought a game over called Bibleopoly because they thought that's all I would play. Bibleopoly, where boardwalk is Jerusalem and you build a church. In the game, I'm like, no, do you have poker chips? <laughs> like, this game sucks, what are we doing? But these people, have not, they don't know. They don't know what's, they're not paying attention. And we sit around coasting as if it's peacetime. Getting no one's attention, never crying out, just going through life. As if people are gonna come to us and say, hey, hey, hey. Jesus cried out. I'm on the plane on the way home. I sit beside this woman. Starts to chat before we take off. Chat, chat, chat. Get in the air. And of course, you guys know I hate flying. So at this moment, I'm like, yeah, I just need to. But she's chatting. So I guess I'm in. I just want to. And all of a sudden, it's, yeah, yeah, I believe in spirituality. I'm like, oh, really? What do you mean? Because so do I. Yeah, yeah, so what I do is I trip out on mushrooms and I connect to the Christ consciousness of the universe. I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, this is what my husband and I do. We enter into the transcendent by tripping out on shrooms and we connect to the Christ consciousness that's in all of us. And for the next two hours, I had to sit and deconstruct her entire worldview, show her that all of her assumptions about Mushrooms, like, I'm like, no, 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 you're not entering into the transcendent when you trip out of mushrooms. Here's what's happening. There's drugs that are going into the synapses of your brain, and they're making connections and making you think you're experiencing something, but it's just brain activity. She's like, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm like, I know, because you're tripping out too much. And then she's like, yeah, but what about the Christ consciousness that's all inclusive? I'm like, no, no, no. There's Jesus, and he's the only way to God. He's the only way to heaven. You need to repent of sin. He's God. He died on a cross for your sin. He rose again, and it's the only way. There's no Christ consciousness in everyone in this plane. There's Jesus is the only way. She's like, you're blowing my mind right now. I'm like, I know. But all I wanted to do was put my earphones in and watch This Is Us. Because it makes me cry. And yet I felt called in that moment to spend two hours trying to get her attention and wave her down from her life, which just is going to go in distraction mode until the day she dies, unless someone cries out. That's the point. And I'm not sure we're all doing it. Because we think that we're in some mundane story that's just slow moving and some romantic comedy. We're not not born. This is what I told the men at the men's conference. We're not born into a, a romantic novel. We're born into a war story. We're born into 
into Lord of the Rings. We're born into Dune. We're not born into pride and prejudice. We're in the midst of a fight and a battle with people around us for their very soul. And Jesus cries out to get their attention. Okay. See, this is why I'm wondering whether they're ever going to get to the water thing because that was all just about the cried out line. So he cried out. He's yelling to the world to get their attention. And then it says this. What does he cry out? Here's what he cries out. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I'll come back to that. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me, that's the Greek word for faith. Pistuo is the Greek word. Whoever believes in me, whoever has faith in me. Now, some of you who are new to church, you got to understand the history of why this is super central and important. There's something called justification by faith. It's the message of the New Testament. That we, from beginning to end in the New Testament, are justified, listen to me, not by your works, not by being a good person, but by faith in Jesus Christ alone. So the Protestant Reformation in the 15, 1600s was a bunch of teachers and preachers coming to realize after they read Galatians, after they read Romans, that the Catholic Church had created all of these rules and steps for people to be saved. You had to say certain prayers. You had to give penance. You had to give money. You had to go to church. You had to say certain... And all of those things might get you into heaven if you did them well. And of course, in the ancient world, religion was all over the place. And Christianity came into that world and says, stop. Religion says you have to try, 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 try. Until you finish one day and maybe your performance, God will say, was good enough to accept you. But then Jesus Christ comes into the picture and he lives a perfect life in our place, dies on the cross in, as our substitute, rises again to give us life. And now our job is not to try to perform, but to understand that Jesus has performed for us in our place. And then we are to put our pistuo, our faith, in him, in what he's accomplished, because really we got to really believe in our heart when he says it is finished, that what? It's finished. Just hear that for a sec though. Because some of you still think that the only way God is going to accept you is if you figure out uh, that, that uh, there, he's only going to accept uh, Democrats. Or he's only going to accept Republicans. Or he's only going to accept the Green Party people. Or he's only going to accept, take your pick, people who like Joe Rogan and people who don't. The feminists, the complementarians, the meat eaters, the vegetarians, the vaxxed. I mean, some of you, you're, you're anti vax and you're like, that's the only way to do it. That's what God's going to honor. Some of you are like, guy, you know the only way God's going to honor? I get vaccinated every week just to make sure. Some of you, you're not me, so you're like, what? No, that's a first person narrative. Some of you think this is the only way to get accepted by God. You know what that is? It's stopping believing in what Jesus just said. You don't get justified by any of this stuff. This stuff is not stuff that saves you. You are justified by faith in me. Everything else is secondary. Justification by faith, the central doctrine of the New Testament church. Grace alone, meaning undeserved favor, through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus. Not what your friends think about you, not what your Instagram followers think about you, not what people at school think about you, not what people at work think about you. The only question is, because you don't have to be good enough for any of those people. You only have to be good enough for God. And here's the beautiful thing. God knew you couldn't do it, so he came and was good enough for you. Guys, end of sermon at that point. That's all you need. That is all you need to hear. And the beautiful part about that story is that God said, I'm going to come and reconcile the world unto myself while you are sinners, and he did it 
motivated and driven by love. And so what he does is he doesn't just expunge evil from the world. He redeems it. That's insane. I watched this uh, video yesterday. Uh, it was this Instagram reel. It was a little kid, okay? He's sitting in front of a bush, and he's like probably this tall, and he's dressed up like a cowboy for Halloween. And his mom's filming him, and I guess his somebody, whatever, their friend, is dressed up like, uh, you know, uh, Michael Myers, like the, the, the killer in ha the Halloween movies, all right? Not like Mike Myers, uh, the Canadian comedian. Uh, Dress up like, like face mask, big black thing, and a huge knife. Like the scariest face mask in movie history. Or Halloween, the Halloween, Halloween psycho. So, little kid sitting there dressed up like a cowboy. Mike, my, Michael Myers comes around the corner with a knife. Like, it's a, I wanted to just run. I'm just watching the video. And he's standing behind, and the kid's looking at the mom. And the mom's just waiting. Like, just wants the kid to lose his brain. And she's waiting, she's laughing. She's like, hey, look behind you. And the kid's just staring at the camera and Michael Myers is sitting there with a knife like this. And the kid looks up at him and he goes like this. And Michael Myers bends down and they hug. And then the guy pretends to stab the kid from the back. But uh, I was like, man. This is such a cool little image of like, I think this kid, rather than running from evil, is trying to redeem it. You see, this is what God does in all of your nastiness, in all of your masks and, and your sin and your selfishness and your, your lust and your gossip and all this stuff. Instead of going done with you, he, 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 he did something that brought you in to actually restore you. That's crazy. And this is why Christianity ends up changing the world. Justification by faith. Now, here's what we gotta understand about this, because we gotta define then faith. Pistuo. Now, crazy thing about pistuo. In the Gospel of John, the word pistuo is used 98 times. But here's the thing that should make you sit up and pay attention. Guys, in a book of the Bible that uses the word the most, it never one time uses it as a noun. It's always a verb. It's crazy. So here's what, here's what one writer says about this. Here's my definition of faith based on that. One of the most provocative observations about saving faith is that the book of the Bible that talks more about it than any book about saving, the saving effect of believing never uses the noun faith or belief, but uses the verb believe, pistuo, 98 times. What was John communicating to us by never using the noun faith or belief, but instead using the verb? I think he chose the verb because believing in its very nature is a kind of acting, an acting of the soul or the heart, before this acting of the soul produces any other kinds of actions. And the kind of acting of the soul that believing is reveals something crucial about the nature of saving faith itself. Believing in Jesus is a coming to Jesus so as to find, listen to me, your heart hunger and heart thirst satisfied. So there's no such thing. Listen, here's what this writer's saying. And this is what John's saying. There's no such thing as a Christian on planet Earth that can say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't take him as my ultimate treasure. Because taking him as your ultimate treasure, being satisfied, right? The water, that's the saving faith. That's the kind of faith that actually saves you. See, this is why this is really important. Because notice he didn't say the kind of faith that saves you is simply uh, symbolically walking down to an altar one day or saying a magical prayer. doesn't say that. He says the kind of faith that saves you because some of you are like, yeah, okay, I believe in God now. Great. Listen, as I've said to you so many times, some of you can even say, I believe in the resurrection. I believe it historically happened. And as I've said many times, Satan believes that too. And it doesn't save him. Right? James tells us this in James chapter 2. The, devil, the, the demons know this, 
and they mock it. They were there at the cross. You think Satan's pondering and wondering whether Jesus Christ really died on a cross and really rose from death? No, but it doesn't save him because he doesn't treasure it. He doesn't care about it and cherish it. That's what saving faith is. It's not there's a kind of faith over here that saves you, and then there's a group of people who actually treasure Jesus Christ above money and sexuality and reputation and beauty. No, it's, there's only this. That's the scary thing about this. Because we've been pitched another kind of faith. So what happens when I sin? What is your sin? Look at what he says. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And you'll be satisfied. You don't, he already said this in John 4. Whoever drinks of my water, they'll never thirst again. But you thirst every day. You sin by going after money and lusting and, and gossiping. And So what is that? What's actually, because if you're fully satisfied in Jesus, then you can't, you're so, okay. So my buddy, uh, he, he runs this, uh, uh, he, he has this pizza oven. And so oftentimes he'll just have us over, a couple other families, and he'll just make pizzas. And it's unbelievable. And yesterday he did this. We all go over there, a bunch of families, and he just makes pizza after pizza. He sits there for three hours and just makes pizza. And we're all sitting there. We feel like we're all 400 pounds. Like we're done. He's fed us. He's forced fed us so much pizza. We can't move anymore. The kids are like, Wah. and then he goes, okay, time for dessert. And the calzones go in. And now we gotta, we're like, I, I, like, I can't, you, you've had this, right? I can't eat anymore. Stop giving me stuff. I'm done. That's what Jesus says. If you've fully partaken in me, you don't hunger anymore for the stuff of the world because you're full. You're just sitting there going, I don't need this anymore. I don't need to gossip behind my friend's back because it makes me feel better. And I'm so weak and insecure that that's the only way I get joy in my life. I don't have to lust. I don't have to go after money and materialism. I don't have to fill in the blank, whatever your sin is. See, you know what, ha you know what sin is? It's the not being satisfied in Jesus. You know what the first sin was in the Bible? It wasn't disobedience. It wasn't eating of the apple or the fruit, whatever the... Genesis lays out. It's not believing that God was telling the truth about him being all satisfying. Think about what the devil puts on the table. He says, I know he told you that if you eat of the fruit, this, this, and this, but it's not true. The reason he told you not to do it is because then you're going to be like him. And so they were like, okay, it's not satisfying enough to just walk with God in the cool of the day. I want something else. And so they ate because they didn't believe God was telling them the truth that he's all satisfying. That's what's happening every time I lust, every time I gossip, every time I, I go after money. That I, It's me not believing that God is actually the thing that's going to make me happy. And it's believing a lie. And that's what happens in our life all the time. Now, he says, now, look at this. I love this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Um, are you even asking the question anymore and moving toward God and asking? wondering about the state of your soul or are you just going through life not answering, asking questions about how can I walk deeper with God? How can I fast? How can I pray? How can I tell people about him? It's, 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 there's something about the coming to himness of it. Like underline that. Uh, who's not gonna be satisfied? Those who come to me, which means you gotta be moving. You gotta be intentional. You gotta say, I'm gonna actually move toward and like, like, I think I shared this last Christmas with you, but it's such a good potent picture of this that I'll, I'll share it again for those of you who didn't see it. So I had a friend a couple of years ago 
He was in Hawaii. He was vacationing with his family. And you remember that? I don't know if you saw that on the news, but that moment where uh, they thought that um, there, there was... A, so he's sitting with his family. His wife's not in the room. And a, and a thing comes up on his phone saying uh, there's a bomb. There's a war, a nuclear warhead or something uh, headed toward Hawaii. You all need to find refuge. Basically, you're all dead. And he's like, wait, What? And so he gathers the kids. And he's like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. North Korea sent over a bomb. We're all dead. But he couldn't find his wife. And he kept texting her and texting her and texting her. He couldn't have walked all over the hotel. Finally, hundreds of people are outside the hotel looking up to the sky. Because what else are you going to do? Just waiting for this bomb to destroy Hawaii. And they've been doing this for like an hour. And finally, his wife comes out. And she's got a towel. And she's like, hey, what's going on, everyone? He's like, where have you been? She's like, oh, I've been working out. He's like, what are you talking about? You didn't you, you, you text? She's like, no, I haven't looked at my phone. What's going on? Why is everybody out here? Because we're all dead. That's why. But she's been working out. Not a care in the world. Well, these massive questions about life and eternity have come up to the fore for everybody else. And Jesus goes, are you even paying attention anymore? Some of us are deciding on the most important things in life, and others of us are just going through life as normal. Some of you are not even interested. You're not even, you're cold to the question. Can I just tell you? There's another version of you that it's not that you're cold to the question about God or Jesus, it's that you're just tired. There's been so much that's happened over the last 18 months. You can't even think of yourself asking the question. Some of you watching online, uh, it's interesting. In this moment as a church, of course, post-COVID, people attend differently. It's a vastly interesting thing. I go all over the states and talk to these pastors and people attend different. Something shifted in the way people do things. And, but, and yet online grows and people are coming to Jesus and it's beautiful to see it because you have to be super intentional to do that. You have to go, okay, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to try to worship. I'm going to... And it's beautiful because you're, he says, anyone who comes to me. See, that's a beautiful thing. It's, there's an intentionality in it. But some of us, were just tired. And we're like, I don't know, where to, I don't know about God. I, don't know, I feel worn out. And this, this text hit me. I, w- I want to give it to you. Listen to Galatians chapter 6. Just a gem in the middle of the New Testament. Galatians 6, 9 says this. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't faint. If we don't faint... Let us not grow weary of doing good. See, some of you, here's how the devil's trying to take you out, okay? There's all kinds of different ways. Some of you, he's trying to tempt you. Others of you, he's trying to get you into false teachings. Others of you, he's trying to put other stuff as the center of your life. But for some of you, you're just getting tired of it. You're weary of doing good. And the reality is, don't be weary. Keep going those who come to me, those who actually get up and go, okay, I'm going to go after this. And some of you are like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just don't feel, I don't feel inspired. I remember this used to be interesting to me. It used to be exciting. My prayers used to get answered. God used to feel alive, like electricity to me. And now he just kind of feels dead. Do you feel that? As I talk to you, I, I, that's the story so often. Can I encourage you though? Let me give you an image. The other day I'm driving by a house and I see a mother walk out the door with her kid. Kid's about three, four years old. And the kid comes bounding out of the house, right, like kids do. Like she's just excited. And she's running around. And the mom is doing the mom thing, which is like, I don't even know if I slept. This kid's a gong show. And just being normal as an adult, just walking out of the house. And if I asked you which one of those two people had more energy... You might say, oh, the kid clearly has more energy. But that's not true, is it? Because that kid's going to be napping in probably two hours, and the mom isn't. She's going to go through life. Because in the end, that adult has more energy running through her body than that kid, but it doesn't look like it. And sometimes we look at spiritual vitality, and we go, man, I remember when I used to, you know, stay up till 2 in the morning and go tell everybody in my town about Jesus, and my prayers just got answered immediately, and I could feel it. And that's when God was real, but now I just kind of... I don't know, I don't feel it as much. It's not right. Doesn't mean you're not mature. 
It just means there might be another season in your life. Because he's still living and moving and speaking and acting. Believe me. Listen, this week I was driving in my car and I spent 20 minutes praying out loud to God. Just about different things. Talking about, hey, you know, be nice to be affirmed in this thing over here. This is a struggle. Or what am I supposed to do over here? All these massive decisions. And, and yesterday my buddy calls me up. He's like, hey, uh, I just want to let you know, um, my daughter uh, is in YWAM. Um, and uh, they're having a prayer time. And some leaders just started to say, hey, well, why, don't, why don't we pray for someone you know? And she started praying for me. And this group of people who don't know me started praying certain things about my life. And she started jotting them down. And then he sent me a picture of it. And he said, here's the things that this random group of people who have no idea who you are prayed for in your life. And I was like, that's the list I was praying for in my car out loud. And it was this beautiful little affirmation. Keep going, kid. I know you're tired. I know you get weary of doing good. But believe me, I'm still alive. I love you. Keep going. So, Lord, I pray that anybody who's watching this, sitting here, thinking about, discouraged, tired, wondering if they're even a Christian anymore, that they would go deep inside themselves and realize not to grow weary in doing good. And that, Lord Jesus, we would learn, even if we already believe in you, we would learn how to actually be fully satisfied in you to treasure you and thirst no more because that kind of quenching faith is actually the faith that saves. That's John's point. Where we are all satisfied in you. And that we'd be challenged if we believe in you and we follow you and we go through the motions that Jesus do a special work in us. Will you alive in a kind of faith in us that treasures you above all things and we change the world through it? Let us respond in worship to the word. All the distractions of our life, all the stuff everyone wants us to do, all the money stuff, all the marriage stuff, all the being cool stuff, can for the next few minutes, Lord, I just pray that this stuff disappears and in this moment we'd be able to just focus on you not on the people around us and we would sing as the Bible tells us to that we would sing a new song and those who might even just be meeting you today for the first time that they would cry out to the crucified and risen Jesus and put their faith in you and as you say one person does that all of heaven rejoices pray that you do that among us. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.